All right. What I was asked to talk about is addressing vaccine hesitancy and looking at evidence-based strategies to increase acceptance. This is one of the strategic priorities of the Immunization Agenda 2030 that was passed by all of the countries at the World Health Assembly uh, earlier. Yes, I can't see any slides down there, so I'm doing my best here. Um, two things I want you to remember about the Immunization Agenda 2030. One is it's immunization across the life course. It's not just about babies anymore, folks. And number two is it's leaving no one behind. All right. And we're not doing a great job on either. Um, as this next slide shows, this really emphasizes, and it, it doesn't matter that this is a, a, from a, a year ago, but it emphasizes that uptake has been uneven with COVID vaccine globally. Part of that was related to uneven distribution and access. I don't want you to remember that word, access. And, but even in high income countries, big differences in uptake of vaccines and big differences in death. It made a difference, folks. It wasn't just airy-fairy. You know, this disease existed. It killed people, all right? And even close neighbors, big differences in what you could see in terms of the rates of deaths per 100,000. So the big thing you have to remember is the vaccine sitting in that fridge is not saving any life. You actually have to have the vaccine in the arm and it has, to, so it has to be accepted and taken up. That's where we see the impact. Not how much the government spent on buying vaccine, but how much it was accepted. And vaccine acceptance is a very complex thing when you make your decision. Lived experiences matter, including historical and present day discrimination. I pause there because we don't think about that enough. It's strongly influenced by what we think others around us are doing or expecting us to do, our social networks. We see causation and coincidences. We see what we believe rather than believing what we see. And we all do that. There isn't a person in the room who doesn't do that. We often prefer anecdote and stories to data and evidence. And we're influenced by whether we perceive the disease as a threat or not. And we pay much more attention to negative information. There's actually psychology studies that have shown that. So negative information sticks. Positive information does not stick as much. And that's why safety concerns and lack of trust are very prominent big problems for us. And access may be difficult. And if you make it hard to get at the vaccine, you're even if you're pro-vaccine, you're much less likely to take it up. So this is the definition for vaccine hesitance that, that we did for the SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy that came out in 2014, published in 2015. It's a continuum between all those people who accept vaccine and are convinced it's the right thing, they don't really have any questions, and they're fine all the way down to the refuse all vaccines, period. They just don't think vaccines are necessary. Don't even go there. And then in between, we have these people, some who accept but are still have questions and concerns or hesitant down to those who refuse all, but they're not quite sure if that's the right thing to do. So what vaccine hesitancy is, is the delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccine services. You can't be hesitant if you can't get access to the vaccine. All right. And it's complex. It's context specific. It varies across time, place and vaccine. And it's influenced by such factors as convenience, complacency and confidence. And we call those the three C's. Well, we now have five C's. We now have seven C model. All of these models have put together factors into little groups that would help you think about what they were all about. We have the five A's model. And last year, we got the WHO Working Group on Behavioral and Social Determinants, better known as BEDS, um, and it put it into these categories, what people think and feel, social processes, motivation, practical issues, and vaccination. Listen, folks, this is like describing this elephant, and everybody's coming at it from a different place, and it's way more complex than that. So I don't know if it's typically Canadian or not, but we put together a much more complex framework for vaccine acceptance, like way more complex because it is complex. 
And one of the ones I want to uh, talk to you about specifically is that purple one. How your healthcare system is set up matters. What programs they have in place. What are their practices? What are the laws and regulations in your country? What are the politicians saying about your vaccine? When we started on this complex when nobody was talking about politics, anybody who's been through the COVID vaccines knows that politicians had a big impact. So you can't ignore that, all right? And the immunization, accurate, reliable information, that's all about the infodemic and misinformation and disinformation. All of these factors matter, not just a few of them, but all of them matter. So I'm sorry it's so complex. Well, we felt really quite good when in 2022, who looked at a whole bunch of the factors that really were associated about whether you accepted vaccines or not. And they noted that there were a lot of factors, not just discrepancies in socioeconomic privileges, demographics, political ideology, or racial disparity. It's way complex out there. And the same thing, one that just came out in 20, this year, um, they were looking at a report of Europe-wide COVID vaccine acceptance, and countries that were next door neighbors had differences, as you can see, in this COVID vaccine uptake rates. And it wasn't just all about access and whether they had vaccines or didn't have vaccines. And then Van Kessel, in a paper that just recently came out, looked at policy variation in 10 European countries. And the vaccination varied by uh, the vaccines used, although they were similar in the number of approved vaccines. So what the uptake was, was different. It also, the schedules, the booster recommendations and all of that, and whether they went after the marginalized populations or didn't was different. And who administered the vaccines and what was your ease of access differed, as well as whether they had mandates or whether you need proof of vaccination to do something. And the data allocation requirements were all different. And this, gosh, this guy lives in the country next door to me and he doesn't have to do that. Why do I have to do this? You know, if you're talking about showing uh, vaccination status. So this, these differences really complicated a coordinated pandemic response, and they were very confusing to the public, and I would add in politicians too, and they affected vaccine uptake and trust in what we were doing. We made a mess. Okay, so I'm now going to talk very briefly, because I only get 25 minutes to do this whole thing, guys. Um, I'm going to talk about common structural barriers. I'm going to talk about common behavioral barriers. And I'm going to talk about common information prop barriers that we've got. So looking at the structural barriers, what the country decides they're going to bring in and pay for in terms of vaccines matters. Because if they don't pay to bring them in, you have trouble getting access to them. At the And that's a political decision. Period. They decide where the money's going to be spent in the Depart Department of Finance. Okay. It's not the head of public health who decides what's going to come in. Then there's the individual costs. We all talk in high income countries and many middle and some low income countries of vaccines being free. They are not free. It costs you money to go and pay and park when you show up at wherever you're going to get your vaccine. If you are a by the hour worker in a high income country and you don't work that hour, you don't get paid. That's a cost to you. And if you're in a low-income country and you're a subsistence farmer and you have to walk four kilometers to get that vaccine, that's going to take you time when you are not doing your farming and your kids may not eat that night. All right? These are costs that we don't talk about. We talk about it being free. It isn't free for anybody. Ease of access, including physical barriers. And this is a big, big deal. So where are the clinics located? What are their hours of operation? Nine to five, Monday through Friday, no nights, no weekends, because that's what the healthcare workers want. It's not what the people who are trying to get vaccinated need. Do you need to book an appointment? Are you blind? I'm not being facetious here. But if I'm asking you to go online to book an appointment, you may not be able to do that. And you are excluded. How far do you have to travel to this clinic when it's open? And what means of transportation is there for you? How expensive is it? And then what about the people who can't leave home? All right, I'm going to be very Canadian here. In our Northwest Territories in January, it's minus 45 centigrade out. This is not warm, folks. If I have five kids under the age of six and nobody else to leave them with, I have to get them bundled up. And they may freeze their faces when we go out if I haven't done this well. What am I? And the mother says, I can't do that. So the nurses actually in the Northwest Territories go to the home 
because it's the only way you can do this for the homebound people because the mothers can't do it. All right. We also look at poor infrastructure. We know there's data that's been presented to you, I think, of zero dose and missed dose kids. But you know what? We don't know what the factors were that made that happen for those kids. And we often don't have that data. The why is missing. Healthcare workers, not up to date and, uh, it, uh, on vaccines, and they've had, they never got trained on some of the pieces that need to be done. The healthcare system barriers. We talk all the time about vaccine stockouts in the district health nurses place. We don't talk about the stock out of the healthcare worker. There's no healthcare worker there to give it. And we don't track that. We track vaccine stockouts. We don't track healthcare worker stockouts. And everybody knows since COVID came, we have a huge healthcare worker stockout across all countries. We don't have enough people. Past experiences with the system. If you came and tried to do this before and I disrespected you, you are unlikely to come back. Language and culture needs, they're not often taken into account or addressed. In my country, you know, we have a huge number of immigrants and refugees every year. The Health Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada's book on infant immunization is published in 14 languages. And I know very few healthcare providers who can speak those 14 languages. So if you're one of those immigrant people who show up at one of these clinics, you don't even know what the healthcare worker is talking about. And nobody can answer your questions. Healthcare workers are not welcoming. <laughs> I got other things to do. Let me drink my coffee. Let me go and chat with the person down the hall. So you wait a little longer, you. Okay. Um, all of those things make a big difference. So ease of access. Oh, I, I could have done a whole talk on ease of access problems. There's a systematic review that was done by, by McCosker that looked at uh, homeless in high income countries and what the access issues were and all the things that needed to be done to make it work. Same studies, UK study that showed the importance of visa access for pregnant women was the number one reason they were not getting immunized. OK, so ease of access. Remember that one. It's not in any of those models. OK, um, review adult vaccination strategies. Most low-income countries don't have strategies for adult immunization, even though COVID vaccines was for them. We'd like them to have flu vaccine. We'd like them to have pneumococcal. There's a whole lot of vaccines that low-income country adults should be getting, but that we don't even have a program yet. We don't know how to get them. We, we, we have no history that we can build on. Should we be going to the markets? What should we be doing? Okay, looking at the shifting. Comment, that's all I'm going to say on structural. Common behavioral barriers, I'm going to do a fly through this because, again, don't have much time. Data, why not immunized or under-immunized? Why? Where? What catch-up programs have you tried and they failed and why did they fail? Okay? And if they were successful, why did it make a success? Forgetfulness, how easy it is to book. We know reminders make a big difference. Tell you you have to show up tomorrow to get immunized at 3 o'clock. You're likely going to show up. If I, and if I don't remind you, less likely. We always talk about spiritual, spirituality and religion as if it was one issue when somebody puts that out. It's not one issue. It's much more complicated. You need to listen and address their specific religious issues. It may be they have a worldview that doesn't accept this health intervention. They just don't believe their worldview is you don't need vaccination. You are strong in yourself and with your God. Divine will and fatalism. Immorality where the tissue cells came from some of the vaccines from before. They, yes, they did come from aborted feces, but these were not, these were spontaneous abortions. They were not abortions that were done so they could get the tissues. But anyways, an impurity of ingredients, this is halal, and also the conspiracy about vaccination. It's a big conspiracy. These diseases are not serious. It's a big fake out there. And inertia. We know that healthcare recommendations really matter. And motivational interview, I'm going to do both of those in a minute. We know that there's bias and risk perception. So what you communicate, how you communicate it, when you communicate it, and how targeted it is, matters. We need to use clear language. It needs to be tailored to fit. And we need to use positive framing, all of which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So healthcare workers, they are the number one most important thing that will persuade somebody to get immunized. The problem is it's not just the healthcare worker who's doing the immunization. 
It's the clerk who's registering them. It's the other people in the system and what they say. And too often we've only targeted training about immunization to the healthcare workers who are actually immunizing. And we forgot about everybody else. And you know what? They're out in la-la land a lot of times around vaccination. And we do know that healthcare workers' own immunization status reflects their patients' immunization status, okay? And we also know that if you educate healthcare workers, you can increase the uptake rate. So we should all have programs that are doing that. And we know that during COVID, studies of healthcare professionals in the U.S. and Canada, well, all were vaccinated or intended to be vaccinated. Many of them were not comfortable about talking to their peers about vaccination because some of them were not keen on being vaccinated or they thought they weren't keen. So they just shut up. Okay. That's not good enough. All right. Uh, This is one slide on effective discussion techniques. First of all, you need to do it as presumptive. Today, you need to get your hepatitis B vaccine. Not what would you like to think about hepatitis B vaccine? Uh, And you need to open the door for questions and queries. And that's where motivational interviewing comes in. This is a mini thing on motivational interviewing, and I've given you the reference so you can go and look it up. It's asking open-ended questions. It's about listening reflectively. It's about then affirming and validated. I understand that your issue here is this. And then may I provide you with some information that I know, and this is where my sources are, and getting permission. And then it's summarizing. Why do we summarize? Because all of you are over five. Under five, you remember verbatim what you hear. That's why little three-year-olds come back and say, well, hmm, oh my God, dad said that. And there it is, word for word, but not the right context. And where us adults, we do gist. So you need to summarize to tell them what it is you need to remember. All right. And there's lots of data to show this. And then you should finish by freedom establishing wording after you've done your motivational interviewing. And that is, of course, it's up to you or the choice is entirely yours. But now that you've gone through the motivational interviewing, They say, oh, and they're still allowing me to choose. Well, I guess I'll choose to be vaccinated. All right. So all these parts, we have evidence to show that they work. I didn't do this slide because I didn't have time to show the evidence for that. But never mind. Then we need to use clear language, standard vocabulary. You can't use words like rare and very rare. We know what a rare steak looks like. But most of the general population have no idea if we say a vaccine er a vaccine adverse event is rare. Does that mean one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a hundred thousand? Okay. They don't know. You probably don't know either. All right. It's between one in a thousand and one in 10,000 for rare. Um, you need a consistent denominator because they're not good at fractions. They really aren't. Okay. You need to be, tell the truth. You need to say, this is what, even if the truth makes you a bit uncomfortable, you need to tell the truth. Our vaccines are not perfect. Explain single event probability. So if you're going to have an adverse event, you either get all of that adverse event or you get none of it. So you either got TTS or you didn't. You didn't get one-tenth of TTS, okay? And people don't understand that. Um, Visual aids really help. Um, Absolute numbers, not relative risk. Most people who do epidemiology courses know what relative risk is. Most of the general public have never done epidemiology. They have no idea when we talk about relative risk or numbers needed to treat. They don't know what that's about. Fact sheets and infographics are really helpful, and there's evidence for that. Don't use jargon. We speak medical speak and nursing speak all the time, and we don't even realize we do it. Um, And we need to frame our messages positively. This is just a document from the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. That's a very simple uh, uh, document that was developed it's free online, that was developed for people um, to teach nurses how to interact, how to deal with questions, how to do all the bits and pieces that will really make it work well. So social norms. Um, work with religious, community, political letters, civil society organizations to make vaccine acceptance the norm so that everybody's talking about it and why it's so important, how it's going to help our community. Impact of mistrust and disinformation. I'm going to do that in in another set of slides. Lack of trust. Work on equity and respect. If this particular marginalized population has been disrespected for generations, you have to really reach out and work with the people that that community trusts. If you're marginalized because you're way back from where the district health nurse's place is and nobody ever goes out to find out what it's like in that very peripheral village, you are not likely going to be very respected when they come in to see you. Oh, you're from that place, you know. 
Um, make sure you look uh, lack of determination because doing nothing is usually easier than getting immunized. You have less, less effort to just not do anything. So make sure access is easy. Reinforce that the vaccine acceptance action is a really good thing. Great job you did. Um, and address concerns. And remember that data tells, but stories sell. So have your own stories to tell about the benefits of immunization and about cases you've seen for patients that have never, that were not immunized. You, any of you who are clinicians, we got those stories. Lack of attention to AEFI concerns. I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow when I'm going to do ethics. Healthcare workers and patients, they all that where the AEFI has happened, they need to know about it. You can't just ignore it and have it out in the media before they even hear what the causality assessment came out to be. Communications matter. And lack of attention to pain mitigation and immunization, stress-related response prevention, so we can decrease those. I'm going to do a little bit more on both of those. So this is to show you willingness to receive a vaccine is very influenced by AEFIs. Indirect exposure, in other words, my next door neighbor says this is what happened when they got immunized, or their son, this is what happened to them, or exp indirect exposure to scientifically unsupported. Look, they've said with HPV vaccine, the deaths, there were 60 deaths last year. Okay, that kind of stuff. And injection anxiety, ISRRs. All right. And it really makes a difference. So you have to frame positively. This is saying it's much better if you say the HPV vaccine is 99.9% .9 safe than it is to say it has less than 0.1% side effects. Those are the same numbers, but they're not heard the same way at all. Okay. And we know in the UK, there's a great study I like very much. 2016, they did the study. Um, they, they looked at the value of immunization programs for newborns and children specifically, but also for adults. And in all age groups, read my lips here. Averting side effects was very important. It was three times more important than preventing the infection in children. Three times more important than, than doing the infection, which we know has a mortality rate for all the ones that we're talking about that we prevent with vaccines. Six times more important if you were between the ages of 65 and 75. Scary, isn't it? You know, the whole balance is out. All right, risks and benefits. How many of you like getting needles? Raise your hand and wave it widely. One person here likes to get a needle, all right? Most of us don't like this, all right? And studies have shown that adults, at least 10 to 15% of adults fear needles. I don't mean they dislike them. I mean they have a needle phobia, okay? And we know that for children, about 30% are seriously concerned about needles, all right? And it increases hesitancy. Why would you walk up to do something that you're scared of? You know? So evidence-based practice guidelines for reducing vaccine injections for all age groups. You will see Tadio down here. It's a series. It's an RCT to show that the interventions actually work. WHO has a document on preventing, on mitigating pain. It's being updated as we speak with a, a module that's going on it so people can teach themselves about this. Uh, for the health practitioners. And we know that the uh, card, which is comfort, ask, relax, and distract, works. We have RCTs now in schools, and we have RCTs in long-term care facilities. It works for seniors. It works for kids. It works, okay? And it doesn't cost anything to do this. All right, so we need to make that vaccination experience more positive because that decreases immunization stress-related responses. So it gives immunizations a better word on the street. The responses that we see, you know, the fainting, the headache, the fatigue, the nausea, the pseudo-seizures, those are all, all ISRRs and functional neurological disorders, which is kind of between psychiatry and neurology. And they sort of, the neurologists kind of got this finally in 2018 and started to be writing about it. So I'm really glad they got there. So what are the ISR common and uncommon responses, the fainting, the hyperventilation, and then the atypical pseudo seizures and other things? Usually five years in, uh, and up. Um, the much more rare, the functional neurological ones, you just have to go and look at this Twitter one I gave you about this woman. It's been all over the internet. I think 24 million people have downloaded and looked at this. It's a functional neurological disorder. There's no way she could have what she has by any neurology thing, but it's between neurology and psychiatry. Doesn't mean she's crazy either, 
But we know we can decrease ISRRs by clear explanations about the immunization, being confident, calm, quiet about the delivery, muscle tension if they think they're going to faint, and, and decreasing pain using card, as I've said. So this slide sticks in your brain, please. So this looks at Moderna. This is an RCT. Wasn't done to look at ISRRs, but sure shows us ISRRs. Look at our placebo groups in both by different ages. Look at pain in the placebo group. This is simply by having that needle stuck in your arm with nothing in it but saline. Okay? And how it varies by the age group. Okay? And then look, swelling. I can't, I can't wish myself for my arm to swell. So the, look at the difference between placebo and the other. Same thing, redness. I can't wish it to go red. I could slap it, I suppose, but I can't do the redness. I, that's not, I can't with stress make that happen. But look at fatigue. Look at headache. Okay. These are ISRRs. I have never seen a company who reported the data in the way it should be reported. And they should be able to decrease a lot of these if they did the proper Interventions that we know decrease ISRRs. Companies, please listen if you're out there. Okay. There, at the point I'm trying to make in this slide is it's not one single problem. They're all trying to bribe us. If this was from Southwest, uh, from Manitoba, one of our provinces down near the bottom. Uh, they had low vaccine uptake even pre-COVID. Um, and a study was done in 2021, three drivers for their low uptake. One was risk perceptions about COVID and COVID vaccines and vaccine safety. COVID was really a conspiracy, you know, and the vaccine's not safe. And then religious and very conservative views and their religious leaders were not supporting vaccine and distrust in government and in science. Okay. So it's not simple. It's not one thing that's making this problem. So we also know that you need to work collaboratively. Again, we've got evidence. You need to work with your local pediatric association, your, uh, your, um, Specialty societies, your civil society organizations, religious leaders, trade or uh, trade unions, business leaders, sports teams, all of them so that everybody's being positive about immunization and the importance of immunization to everybody's community and to the individual. And we know that when that happens, the healthcare worker who's giving the immunization feels supported by the whole community around them. Um, and then I'm going to change to information barriers. Actually, I probably should go back because that is an important comment. Um, there was a UK example where an ethnic minority Orthodox Jewish communities in the north of London, um, they were they had terrible vaccine uptake. And when they went to figure out what was going on, they found out there was a real problem because they had many kids. The dates on when you could come in and get immunized, some, some of them, they were going to do an extra clinic on Saturday, which is their Sabbath, which would be not a good day. And there was nowhere for daycare for the other kids when they were bringing them in. Okay, so it's a real problem. But when they worked with the rabbis, they were able to get much of that solved and then listened and then made the access fit who the families were. Information, mis- and disinformation, lack of adequate information to direct quality vaccine sites, language and cultural issues, complexity of the information. What we talk about in our groups, the general public doesn't understand. And data tells, but stories sell. Remember that forever. That's why marketing is done the way it's done for all kinds of products that they sell to us. And contradictory advice. I don't have any time to do this one. And that's the booklet from the Public Health Agency of Canada that we have in 14 languages because we need it. All right. Not addressing mis- and disinformation is actually, I think, unethical. We did a study, uh, Canadian Council of the Academies in Canada, that was uh, came out in... Uh, uh, 2023. And in Canada, but in a nine month period, um, in 2021, if we had addressed hesitancy and the hesitant people were the ones who believed that COVID was a conspiracy out to get you, if we had been able to convince those people to be immunized, we would have had 200,000 less fewer cases, 13,000 fewer hospitalizations, 3,500 fewer ICUs, and 2,800 less deaths. And we would have saved about $300 million. You need to know Canada's population is only 38 million. We're not a huge country and our hospital costs are dirt cheap. All right. An ICU visit is only probably about $25,000. Okay. That's Canadian discount to 20 if you use US dollars. Very cheap. Okay. 
So big deal. And others have now published the same kind of data to show if we could just get some of those people immunized, it would have saved many, many, many deaths. So misinformation and disinformation, again, listen up on this. Three things we need to do. One, the target is the general public. You need to be firefighters. That means you need to make the facts the hook and make it work. You can use humor, however it is, but you need to speak up, not just to patients, but in your social networks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Um, uh, clearly, use shareable data and stories. Be creative. Tell them where they can go and look up more things. And highlight the consensus that the science says this, okay? It's not just you, but you have huge science behind you. Then we need more fireproofing, which is individually inoculating the public so that they're less able to be conned by misinformation. Why is misinformation done? Only three reasons, folks. They want to make money off of you. They want to do polarization. They're doing this for political reasons. And they're doing this for self aggrandizement They want to be important. Okay? And it's what it all is. And once you start teaching that and teaching them the techniques, the general public that they do use, you can be successful in protecting them against that. And then fire marshalling. This was uh, structural changes to what is allowed on Facebook, uh, not on Twitter anymore. They changed that. They were working quite hard in doing this stuff, but not now. Okay. Um, Finland, take a bow, Hannah, um, have done a wonderful K to grade 12 education program on media literacy skills to detect mis- and disinformation, to detect pseudoscience, and it has made them the most literate country, media literacy country in Europe. We could do this too if we did the same kind of thing. You can do this tonight in between when you're finished and when you have dinner. It takes 20 minutes. This is the UK bad news game. It sharpens up your skills about how you get conned by misinformation. And you too can become a troll. Okay. And it's about you're wearing your badges for impersonation, emotion, polarization, conspiracy, discrediting and trolling. And if you choose the morally right thing to do, it says, no, 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 no. You will never be a power on the internet. If you do that, you want to go back and do the bad thing. All right. And there is now, they have now looked at this and done RCTs. It does change how people see um, uh, the media and how they are protected. Um, it, the top one, the get, get bad news ones is for 14 and up. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your religious background. It doesn't matter your high school education or whatever. Then the junior game is for uh, children under the age of 14, I think from uh, eight up. It's example of fireproofing. So in summary, what I want to say is the expectation over the next decade is there's going to be more vaccines across all age groups. We need to get our app together. Vaccine acceptance is very, very complex. That's why I showed you the complex Canadian diagram. Mis- and disinformation is an important effect factor affecting vaccine acceptance globally. We need to get healthcare uh, professionals and immunization programs to have better communication skills. They need to be able to build trust. This is not a knowledge gap. It's way more complex than that. It's not just telling somebody, get vaccinated. It needs to be a multi-program, multi-pronged, multi-layered program to increase acceptance. We need to make access easy. Please put that in flashing lights. It, we need to fit the program to the needs, not the people having to fit to the program. And we need to educate healthcare workers about that. They need to understand and listen to their patients when they're having trouble getting access. We need to grow collaborations, academic societies, academe, religious leaders, business leaders, civil society organizations to increase trust in vaccines. And we need to influence the politicians. And we need to do that with community support. And lastly, we need more firefighters, all of you. And uh, we need more fireproofing and fire marshalling if we're going to combat the infodemic. So this isn't optional, folks. People are going to die if we don't do this right. And so my question to you, just like Phil's was, what are you as an individual going to do about this? This isn't something you leave to your department or your hospital or your company. It's you. You own this. And what else is going to happen at your university and your hospital beyond you owning this and at your government and your company? Because you got to step up here. Thank you.
Thank you, Nona. Lovely lecture as usual and many new things to think about. Well, I don't want to say the same thing every year. That's great. It'll be dull. <laughs> so questions, please. Um, Tan Yui from Thailand. Uh, regarding the misinformation, uh, in Thailand we have some situations that uh, during COVID, everyone would like to express their thought, their opinion. And we have a situation that even a physician uh, express their thought that create mistrust. But we as an institution, we don't know the boundary or how to handle with that. So I'd like to learn from your experience how to deal with that. Yes. There are many countries where that's been happening about COVID. And the other problem is, is more of these physicians who have not been trained in immunization because a lot of medical schools and nursing schools don't have a lot on vaccines. And even in the residency programs, they don't have enough on vaccines. So it means we have a lot of physicians that are just know like what the general public knows, not much more. But we do know because there's studies to show, RCTs to show that sitting down with those physicians and educating them about immunization makes a difference. Now, you can do a short version using motivational interviewing, a short version of motivational interviewing. What is it that you're concerned about, Dr. Who? And, you know, and then going on affirming and doing exactly what I talked about. Or you can do it more systematically, working with your local um, physician college or your whoever licenses your physicians or the societies that they belong to. But we need much more push on immunization. I didn't put the slide in to show you of the uh, 17 sustainable development goals, immunization affects 14 of them. Uh, my situation is that um, the physician is an anti-wax yes. himself. And that's why you and, have to and, sit down and you try to find out what is it about vaccines that they don't like. They, they just have like a, a belief that mRNA make um, um, bad things. And, and my, my question is that are they as are we as a, a community of healthcare workers, can we have like suspended there or, or whatever because... Because okay. the dean is so so frustrating that that, that comes yeah. back to this diagram where I said it depends it depends how your healthcare system is set up it depends and and do not repeat this because I haven't really I'm going to say something that I I have to be careful there are some countries where the licensing board for physicians has defined that a physician who is spreading misinformation has may lose their license. There are other countries that are not doing that, and they're forcing them to do education. I will tell you, forced education doesn't usually work, okay, because they don't pay attention to the forced education, which is why I said one-on-one -on -one doing motivational interviewing, sitting down and saying, what is your concern? Ah, your concern is about what mRNA does. Let's talk about that. What do you really think it does? Ah, can I share with you some of the evidence? Can I share with that where that evidence came from? And then going through that step by step. That's your most successful way of doing it. But I, I have to say, you're, you may decide in Thailand that your licensing authority is going to say, you know, so. Because um, one of uh, my, my kids, the person is a psychiatrist himself. So he have a way of motivation interview or make people convincing that yeah. ID physician. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's very hard. It is hard. Yeah. And what you need to do is find a psychiatrist who's pro-vaccine. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic. I am not being sarcastic, okay? Because that person will be trusted. That That's the trust thing I said. Because the psychiatrist who doesn't believe that vaccines are good, another psychiatrist who does, and this is his reasoning, he's much more likely to believe this guy than he is me as a pediatric ID doc, okay? So I wasn't being sarcastic. Please. Um, hi, I'm Tarel. Um, a lot of um, blame for the vaccine hesitance that we are now seeing has been put on politicians, um, conspiracy theorists, etc. But I was also thinking about the role of us as scientists, healthcare workers, whatever. And granted, in the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know a lot about it. But come on, there was so much information. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. The vaccine is going to prevent infection. Oh, it's only going to prevent mortality, etc., etc. And how people who had legitimate um, concerns 
were were treated initially. Yeah. And now fast forward to um, two years um, later, I know initially in low mid- middle income countries, the issue was access, mm-hmm. but now we have vaccines expiring. Yeah. And we have people who have seen the mortality is not as high as you think. I'm not really at risk. I can get vaccinated and still get it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they still pressure on programs to, you know, move the vaccine, get people uh, vaccinated. And I'm just interested to know what are your thoughts on, on that and how so, you advise programs moving forward. So that's a very complicated question, but a couple of points to make. Number one is I think many countries did not do this well, all right? And many countries had politicians speaking over here and had their medical officers of health speaking here and never together to look like they were in agreement, okay? And um, the province that I live in, health is a provincial responsibility, not a federal responsibility in Canada. The province that I live in, our chief medical officer of health once a week had a conference call that was video casted across the province and also on radio with socially distanced with the premier sitting there. And the premier would keep looking at the thing and nodding his head for everything that the chief medical officer. We have one of the highest rates of vaccine acceptance um, for COVID, for our primary series and for boosters of anywhere because they were together. We then got a new premier because we had an election. Well, he decided he'd give the message along. He didn't need the chief medical officer. And it's not been heard in the same way. So we need to structurally think not only what our message is saying, who our messenger is, who's giving it, and how they are seen to be being supported in doing that. And we need to say, as science evolves, we're evolving our program. And we have not been clear on that. We should have been clear from the very beginning. So that's my brief answer. We could spend all day answering that one. (laughs) Please. Thanks. Uh-huh. Oh. Oh, the, two, the two of you. Last oh, this, should, this might be quick. Thanks, Noni, for a great um, lecture. Um, I want to just ask about a, something I've been taught and whether you think this is correct. The difference between an anti-vaxxer and vaccine hesitant, and I guess it comes back to the first question. I've always been under the impression that it's it's not the best use of my time or energy to try and change the views of an anti-vaxxer. So I'm really talking about that end, 1%, and um, much better to invest my time in someone who's vaccine hesitant to address their concerns and questions. Is that correct? Okay, I'm going to answer that as a yes, no, okay? <laughs> it is correct if you look at the output for the time you're going to put in, and there is evidence for that, Okay. Vaccine deniers, which are the are a chunk of the vaccine refusers, they are almost immovable because most of those real rabid vaccine deniers are making money out of being a vaccine denier. Okay, but it doesn't mean they won't change when when the context changes or when the vaccine changes. So my comment is, if they showed up in a clinic that I'm working in, and I recognize that I don't spend a lot of time with them. But I will not debate them because there's no point in debating because the science is clear. And I say that. And then I say, but, you know, at some point you may want to look at this in a different light. And then I usually tell one story about watching a child damaged because they were not immunized. Okay. And then I say, so if you should find yourself in a situation where you now understand how important vaccines are, I would be pleased to talk to you again. Thank you very much. Out the door. Takes about 15 minutes max. <laughs> no, and I'm not being sarcastic. It's Then I've got that other 45 minutes for the consultation to spend with somebody else that I actually may be able to do. But I, it has three pronged. I'm saying we're not going to debate. The science is clear. Um, I recognize where you're coming from. And here's a story you need to know. And when you're ready to change, notice not when I'm ready to change, but when you're ready to change, I'd be really pleased to see you. And I've had some of them come back. Last question, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tilanga from Sri Lanka. Um, no, in Sri Lanka, we are having a very small community who are hesitant for vaccination. And we do see 
there are relatives and friends most of the time. So when we inquire the issues, the why they are hesitant, so basically uh, religious issues, then there's some claim about poor quality. Actually, we have uh, good answers for those two. But the last group, uh, they say like, uh, no disease, so why you are having the vaccine? So now uh, then we try to explain them in a simple language about this herd immunity and everything. So then we say because of or everybody else, your kid is being saved. So then they come out with, so then you better go there and tell them, so others to vaccinate, so then automatically my child will be protected. So, so, how to, uh, so there, there are two things I do with those populations. And there are two stories I always tell, okay? And one of them is, where's tetanus, everybody? Where's the tetanus bacillus? Where is it? It's in the soil. This has nothing to do. There's never, ever, ever will be community immunity to tetanus. And I make sure they understand that because they all thought community immunity protected them against everything. And then I tell them about a child I looked after in a high income country who had tetanus. Older child immunized fully, younger child immunized fully, had been told by their family doctor because they had had a high fever with their first DPT, they didn't need any more and they shouldn't have it. And let us say we followed up with that physician afterwards. Because that, that was wrong. And and then you have to listen and go on. Can I just say a slide I didn't put in because I didn't have time is one question I'll be asked, I'm sure, today. Everybody wants to know what they should do about their uncle, their cousin, their aunt, their next door neighbor or whatever who's anti-vax. And my comment is you do exactly what I told you. You stand up and say, we will we differ on this because the science is clear and you go down through your thing because the reason is if you don't all the people around them think you're agreeing with them and if you don't speak up you're helping them spread anti-vax 